I can still watch her walk away from me in the same, you know, two piece pink outfit that she had on that night. I can watch her walk away from me. And in my dreams, I'm just screaming at the top of my lungs not to go, like just don't go, right? Or when you're giving the hug for the end of the night, I'm, I'm giving her a hug for the end of whatever time I've ever had with her. I'm just screaming in my dreams, going, Jesus, don't go. Like, just don't stay here. You hold on to her, and of course, then you wake up. That's what mom used to say. She'd talk about if, if at least we could find her, just find mm-hmm. her. Three times a year, we got to watch mom just die a little bit more. And, and I mean, you could see the change in a day. Hello, listeners. We're Shedding Light, and I'm Candy. I'm Angela. And I'm Susie. And we're hell-bent on shedding light on unsolved missing persons cases across Canada. In an attempt to find the missing piece of the puzzle. What you are about to listen to is the culmination of countless hours of research. In an attempt to gather as many facts as possible about the case by reading news articles online blogs and forums, and by interviewing friends, family, and people involved in the case. We will discuss different theories and possibilities and pick them apart in order to evaluate their likelihood, or better yet, eliminate them. We weren't there. We don't claim to know what happened. We can only try to paint a picture using the resources that we do have. We don't claim anything to be fact that isn't. We don't claim our interviewees' words to be fact. It's their memory. It's their recollection. It's their truth. And it's their opinion. And everybody's entitled to one. That does not mean we necessarily share any of these opinions. And listeners, please remember, everyone, including the suspects, is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Please bear that in mind as we welcome you to Season 4, Episode 3, The Search for Lois. In partnership with Please Bring Me Home and sponsored by Bruce Power. Bruce Power does more than power one in three homes, schools, hospitals and businesses in Ontario. They create cleaner air. More than 95% of Ontario's electricity is generated by non-emitting sources such as nuclear, hydroelectric and, to a lesser extent, renewables such as wind and solar. Just a heads up that there is some foul language and adult content in here. Listener discretion is advised. Isn't that something there? I thought I was going to have to, 33 years, I was going to have to go through some study notes on this. It's a long time. I can watch Lois walk away from me in the arena. I just have to close my eyes and I can watch the back of her. And I don't know how many times I dream at night, holy Lord. You just scream and you'll see this in the dream and I'll be just screaming wide open, trying to tell her to stop, stop, stop. Like don't, mm. or, or she's doing the hug and you just hold on as hard as you can. Don't go, like don't, like it's, it's crazy how that holds on. In our last episode, we left off with the family of Lois Hannah now realizing that their sister and daughter was missing. If you haven't listened to episodes one and two, we suggest you do in order to familiarize yourself with Lois's story. Lois's brother, Jim, had been back home in Lucknow that fateful weekend to also celebrate the homecoming, but had already traveled to Windsor on that Monday morning, only to receive that upsetting call from his mom that made him turn right back around. I was back in Windsor when I got a call from my mother and said that Lois is missing. And my mom knew she was missing immediately. And she so, said then, I don't hope, you ever, we'll, we'll hope we'll ever be able to see her again. But she knew at that time there was something wrong right then. As we know, Lois left the dance in Lucknow around 11.30 p.m. She should have arrived home in King Carden around midnight Sunday night. Monday morning, when her boss Debbie realized that she had not opened up the clothing store of McGee's, as she was scheduled to do, She called a part-time employee to go over to Lois's to check on her. After confirming that Lois's car was in the driveway and the doors to her home all locked, the employee made her way through a bathroom window to look for her friend. Once she confirmed that Lois was not in the house, she became alarmed as it appeared that Lois in fact made it home, but had simply vanished. 
Shortly after noon, Lois's brother, Dave Hanna, arrived at Lois's to join his mother, a few of Lois's friends, and a King Carden police officer. Immediately, they said their skin was just crawling when they got in the place. Like, Lois wasn't there. There's some lights on. It's just a kitchen mm-hmm. counter. And they walked, they walked out the locked door. So the door was locked. They had to unlock the door to get out the door. It was apparent Lois had made it home and was going about her evening routine until it seemed she was interrupted by something or someone. The garbage was found tied up at the curb and ready to put out the following morning. Her purse was in the house and her keys were in her purse. Lois never went anywhere without her purse. And she most certainly would not have locked her doors and left the keys behind. That made no sense. Nothing was making any sense. It seemed as though she had set her tea down to answer the door as it was left on the counter, the cup still half full. Big question was, where was Lois? Did something happen in the house or did she willingly leave? The latter seems unlikely given the circumstances. Was there an argument, an altercation? Did she open the door for a stranger or someone she knew? Did something happen in that house to incapacitate her? An accident or purposeful? So many questions. Well, it sounds like even Lois's friends were at the house and sent something was very wrong. As Dave said, their skin was crawling. We have reached out to speak to two of these women, but they or their families say it's too traumatic and upsetting to speak of. That's right. Back in August, I spoke with one of the young ladies who ended up at Lois's house that day. She was very busy when I called, but she did share some insight. She told me talking about Lois's disappearance brings back a little bit of memories and not good feelings. She said even talking about it gets her very shaken up. She stopped in at Lois's that day as she saw Christine and Michelle heading to Lois's, so she went around the corner and pulled up. She thought maybe they were popping by for lunch or tea and she might join in. Hey, is the tea kettle on? It was unfortunate that when I called, it was her busy season at work, summer and the height of tourist season. But she agreed to speak again in the fall. When we reached back out, however, she informed us she was not interested in discussing any further details or having any participation in the podcast. And I spoke with Christine's mom as well. Christine was the young lady who gained entry through the bathroom window. Her mom told us that she was pretty certain her daughter would not be interested in discussing anything with us, as it's too painful. Her mom knew Lois and commented how very sad her story is. I left our contact info, but have never heard back. Not that it's a big deal, but we've heard conflicting accounts of how Chrissy actually left the house, whether it was through the window or out of one of the locked doors. We just, we just don't know. Also, another detail not totally clear about Lois's pink outfit she wore to the dance the previous night. It was either hanging or neatly folded in the closet. The rest of her clothing from the night seems to have been found in a hamper or on the floor of her bedroom. But to the very best of our knowledge, all of the clothing that Lois was wearing the previous night was accounted for. I still can't believe that the police officer handled the teacup and dumped the contents down the drain. Not to mention the other questionable things he did by contaminating potential evidence. Like, holy (laughs) cow, come on. Like Crime scene 101 says, wear gloves, don't move anything, take pictures, and certainly don't touch anything. In the days that followed, it was discovered that a peach-colored nightie and a robe were missing from Lois's wardrobe. It seemed as though no shoes were missing from Lois's house, indicating she had been barefoot. Police had completed their preliminary investigation, including completely mishandling potential crime scene evidence. Being left with little faith that authorities would assist in the next few crucial hours, the frustrated Hannah brothers took matters into their own hands. It was very apparent how Lois's brothers felt about the police. First, we get there and this jackass town cop is there. I, I've come into this scene and Lois's car is there. I'm looking at the car going, what the hell? There, there's a, a, a group of girls there 
and here's this Rogers, and he's going, wow, so. And he grabs this cup of tea, he goes, so, he's saying, you know, he's looking at this cup of tea, he says, so, you think Lois made it home last night? I'm thinking, hey, jackass, the, you're holding a cup of tea in your hand, the lights were on, the door was locked, you can see her clothes, the car's right there, and then he goes, and he takes a cup of tea and he pours it down the sink. I said, I don't think we should be touching a bunch of this stuff right now. And he looks at him and he goes, what do you think you're gonna do, take fingerprints? I'm like, uh, do you know, actually, comes to the purse. He goes, he, he, he goes out and he, he wanted to get in the car. Well, okay, he comes back, car's locked, there's keys for the car. So he takes Lowe's purse in front of everybody and he just takes it about a foot and a half off the table, he goes, Whoosh, and he's point. pushing the contents of her purse all around, pushing it all around. The keys were right there. He takes the keys and he's outside. I follow him out to the car. Of course, he's under the seats and he's in the glove box and he's rummaging around. I'm thinking, you stupid ass. Like, I don't think you should be touching this stuff. He goes, oh, he kind of rolls his eyes. He comes back in. He goes, well, he says, clearly she didn't go for a gravel run. He said, that car's got a half a tank of gas in it. What the hell kind of investigation is that? And of course, I said this to him. He's like, well, you're kind of grumpy. I'm like, I don't think you should be touching this shit. I seriously. And that that's so there's there's where there's where we start. And of course, he's he's on the job. Uh, you know, he's on the job. He's done his preliminary investigation. He's got Lois Hanna's name. Now, you know, you can be reassured he's on the job. I'm thinking, oh, wow, we're in a tank of shit here, boys. Mm -hmm. yeah. This isn't good. This isn't good. It was Monday night and Dave, feeling panicked and desperate, called a friend to round up bodies to search for Lois. We put the word out that night, that night, like but this is afternoon. I started putting the word out. I phoned a buddy of ours, Gord Camp. I said, Gord, we need some help here, man. I, I was part of the Lanes of the Lord's ball team. I said, round up the boys. I said, I need some help. I said, we, we've got to cover some ground. I said, is it Lois? I think Lois is in some trouble here. So we covered, we started doing grid searches around in town, just block to block, you know, asking people pleasantly to start with. Then I was like, okay, we've got to cover some ground here because we're losing daylight on the mm -hmm. first night. The first mm -hmm. night we do this. Lots of phone calls being made. We're driving around, driving around. Uh, the Canadian Tire Store was closed at the time. I phoned Jim Dixon. I said, Jim, I said, I, we're running out of daylight. I need some Jesus big lights right now. We're like. So he goes, oh, God, he said, the store is closed. I don't know. I said, Jim, seriously, I need some goddamn lights. Just get me some lights. So we went in and I bought, they, they opened the store up for me. So I bought a bunch of these great big, they used to be the old six volt battery. Yeah. You know, the two turn screws and the big dome. It's like the big them. spotlight thingies. Yeah. Well, they yeah. were, I yeah, bought they were good lights. Of those and, and whatever flashlights we could get our hands on left. It was, uh, they were fairly expensive lights at the time. And I thought, geez, okay, well, we, so we're here. We are driving up and down the side road. Now the lights, the lights going away. I got the light above my head in the back of a pickup truck. Stand in the back of a pickup truck, and the guys are driving like they're covering ground crazy. And I'm just shining the flashlight down the bottom ditch to see if I can see anything of Lois. If only we could all be blessed with brothers like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. That first light Tuesday morning. Many more volunteers came to assist in the search, and another of Lois's brothers, John, flew in from Winnipeg. They were pleading for OPP assistance. Just one officer, they said, just one officer to assist them with how to conduct a search. We weren't asking for an army of people. We we're asking for one person. Jesus Christ, can we just get some help? I don't care if they didn't know anything about us, Maybe we were the most crazy bunch of bastards you've ever met. But the effort that we were going through, like Brother John was home from Winnipeg the Tuesday morning. Jim Jim was home. You were Monday night. I drove down to Windsor on Monday morning. Okay. And then I was there and I got a phone call Monday night right. from mom. And she says, Lois is missing. It's like, you got to come home. And I went, holy crap. Okay. So I, so I'm phoning. And anyway, I'm just phoning around trying to find somebody that answered phone so I can get a car. And then I got one and I was gone. And this army shows up Tuesday. Well, Brother John's flies in from Winnipeg Tuesday. I'm thinking, okay, I don't care how ridiculous like, this family is. The cops had to kind of go, this, these guys are taking this kind of serious. Mm -hmm. They're going through a lot of effort here. And Jesus, the town's upside down. There's goddamn four-wheelers running all over the place here. And, and OPP wasn't stepping in. 
We were, we were after the head of Ontario Provincial Police Commission or whatever, whoever the head was at that time, begging them for some assistance. The town police are stifling everything we're doing. We just needed one person to say, you know what, if you're, if I was going to organize a, a search with this many people, this is kind of what I would start. And that's, that's all we were asking for because we couldn't get, we couldn't get Lois's name released to the CKNX yeah. the local, uh, station here at the time. They were all sitting back. No, so no, you're we, asking for OPP we, assistance. We were asking yeah. for one officer that knew how to run searches. Just show us what to do. Like we didn't want a whole army of friggin' police, and that's where the cops are going. The town police are going. Oh, look at you! You're getting all worn out. Like it's hot, it's sweaty. They're in there with their jelly donut and a nice, ice cold drink in their hand. I'm like, you jackasses! We're running out of time here. We need some help. So we just started doing our own thing. We knew we had no assistance. And we were defying anybody to stop us from doing what we were uh, doing. Fuck, that we makes me so there. angry. Oh, uh, angry. We were, ground, we were covering ground huge. That, oh. The Hannah boys were also approaching the local media, requesting they publicize Lois's disappearance. Unfortunately, the media at that time seemed unable or unwilling to report on a disappearance unless police gave the go-ahead and reported Lois as missing. The family went to the police station for assistance and guidance, but it soon became apparent they were on their own. Honest to God, the next morning, like we're out in the crack of any sort of sunlight and we're doing the exact same thing, covering more ground. We go to the town police and say, okay, so how do we do? We get hold of CKNX. Can you put a word out? We're looking for Lois, something's not right here. And they're going, well, it's usually the police that do that. The police release this story to us. Uh, you know, they the, CKNX was, they would have liked to, but it had to be somebody from the police had to release it to them. Uh, Raised back down to the police station. Guys, come on. Like, they're get going, it oh. out there. Yeah. Big jelly yeah. donut in his face. He's going, oh, so, you know, you guys just calm down. You're getting Everybody's Your getting sister's old. not missing. That yeah. big fat yeah. fuck yeah. Rogers yeah. there. I said it. I said she's it. Old enough, 25 You're years old. She's just gone for a drive somewhere. I'm like, She's not missing. I said, great, I'd like to talk to her. Could you produce her for me? She's not missing. No, she's not missing. Just they were complete denial. Like just well, pieces and of then, course, crap. I, I put the phone call out on Monday night to Gord and, and then there was like 75 or 80 of the guys from the Lanesville ball team and wow. the surrounding farmer areas. They showed up with ATVs, quad runners. They had motorcycles. They're going, they come there. I said, just, I said, I don't know what to do guys. Just meet at the police station. So we're down at the police station going, okay, Let's, what do we, what do we do? Like, let's, we're doing a, we're looking for Lois. Guys, like, cops are like, oh, geez, you're getting everybody all excited, Dave. Just come, we're on the job, Dave. Let's, let, be reassured, we're on the job. I'm thinking. Doing, doing what? what? Yeah, yeah, doing what? Thinking, Eating jelly donuts. This guy thinking, we are in such trouble here right now. So I thought, okay, what do we do? I'm looking at Gord, I'm looking at the guys. I mean, we got an army of people standing on the street going, Dave, what do we do? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what the hell to do. The police seemed to focus their efforts on preventing the Hannahs from securing a location for a headquarters to make plans to search for Lois. Their requests to use the local fire hall and then a school for a base of operations were denied. So we all went down at the well, you know, there's a few people rummaging around Lois's place. We went back to Lois's place. Well, we started the headquarters out of Lois's place. Actually, remember you you, you tried you tried to get the fire department, and and they initially agreed to it, and then they the police stopped that, and uh, and we needed we, and it was before cell phones, so you needed a landline, and that and that and and we'd already had the the police had already chased away the fire department, so any help we could get from the town was was gone. Yeah. Reluctantly, the decision was made to use Lois's house as a base, as there was no other choice. The boys and their mom, who was still on the family farm, all lived outside of town. Not exactly convenient to operate a base camp from. It was totally understandable why they did what they did. Out of sheer desperation, that's that. That's the the reality that we had to make a decision to use Lois's house. Worst decision ever. 
King Carton police were concerned that the Hannah brothers were going to upset the community with their passion and vigor to find their sister. Town cops are going, jelly donut at hand, going, wow, oh, you're really upsetting the town. I'm thinking, just reduce the goddamn name to the to the to the public. Right yeah. That's all we want. Just reduce Melissa's name. Seriously. That's that's all we need you guys to do and get the fuck out of the way after that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were desperate and they needed outside help which they were not getting from the authorities. The family was aware that they could potentially tamper with or destroy any trace evidence that may be in Lois's house, but they also knew time was of the essence and they needed to find Lois immediately. We started out of Lois's house and, oh, Jesus, if I could backpedal now any place else. I, I, don't, I think most of the evidence was pretty much destroyed when that jackass came in. Between the girls, hey, got, in. Dave, they, I know we beat ourselves up over this over and over again. We had a three-day window. That was it. Mm-hmm. We and we knew, like, just we you leave a human in that heat without water, and that's and that was it. it. It was it was more important to do something quickly than it was to do something smart. Sorry, there I were no you. cell phones, right? Yeah. We were we yeah. had to have landlines. This is, oh, like I say, this is 88. Right. We're doing this by the old landline, and it's it's word of mouth and that stuff. Yeah. It was, there was none of that stuff. Cell phones were in their infantile. Yeah. Uh, at that point, yeah. I didn't have one in my own car. It, the, wor- the world changed quickly over a short period of time after this event. The Lois's brothers were faced with a monumental task and zero experience searching for a missing person. Remember, this was the late 80s. There was no internet to research, no social media to organize. Imagine what they were faced with. Kudos to them to even have the wherewithal during such an emotional time to pull off what they did on their own. And it most definitely warms the heart to know that that community sprang into action to help one of their own, committing countless hours and resources supporting and volunteering in the searches it's such a shame that they had to jeopardize the actual crime scene because they had no other choice that must have been such a lonely and desperate feeling my god imagine the feeling that you had to act on your own the panic that every minute could be her last they just lost lois's dad four months earlier and now she has disappeared What an absolute nightmare. The Hanna brothers went on to further explain how they organized the daunting task of searching for their sister. There was an enormous amount of support from the locals, including friends and neighbors. Volunteer searchers went house to house, farm to farm, building to building, in the hopes of finding Lois. Putting the word out to the Lanes of the Lords, like Gordy and all those guys, they showed up with a goddamn army of people, and we took advantage of them huge. The air cadets, uh, the concurrent air cadets joined in, wow. and there was locals all of a sudden they heard there's a big fuss of what was going on. People were coming in. Can we help? Like, is there something we can do? And, and we we started with town maps, grid to grid to grid. We started with the with the the municipal maps, side road to side road to side road. We had to cover, we started just block it off. Okay, you guys go out, check this grid. You guys go out, check this grid. You guys go out, check this grid. And and so the guys were on the beach. They had motorcycles flying up and down the goddamn beach. How many oh. volunteers would you say you had in the beginning, Dave, in those first few days? Oh, my God. Hundreds. There, there, hundreds. Was, there was probably literally 80, hundreds. 80 some people just came from the ball team and one phone call to Gord. Yeah. And there was how many? I'll bet you there'd be another. 50 or 80 more friggin' people of locals that knew Lois and like just people we would know and then and the word got out pretty quick. Then all the neighbors started rolling. We there was hundreds. There was hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. When it was in, in the very start. And like, the thing is, was, there was no the, none of these people doubted the fact that there was a problem. Like mm-hmm. this this was immediate, like they all understood. Like, and it's like, okay, anybody that knew Lois, she's a creature of habit. The fact she was separated from that purse is the thing that probably bothered everybody the most. They knew there was something. There was something wrong, and it was hot. Mm -hmm. And we had very little time. 
And everybody that was there understood that. It was like, this is going to be figured out in the next two or three days, or what happens after that is really not that important. There was a sense of urgency. Then that's what it was. It's like, we got to find her and we got to find her now. Mm -hmm. And and that's all it was. It was it was almost it was almost madness because oh it's panic. But the thing is like this is it. We, the, the, we have this much time, and if we don't do something about this now, it isn't going to change the outcome. One of the volunteers recounted the events of the search as he participated in within the first couple of days after Lois's disappearance. We were in the, just finishing up our our haying. I remember I was over at the other barn and there was my either my wife come over and and said that, you know, heard this on the news and it was like, whoa. So then we, we found out that they were forming a search party and they were starting at her Lois's place up in King Carden. We got there and if, if I recall, it was like a little brick bungalow. And the first person that was in inside the door, I mean, she's my aunt and used to be a neighbor of uh, the Hannahs. Okay. So it was my aunt, Aunt Cora. So she was sort of looking after inside the house and there was a few, few other people in there and they were, they were forming the parties and said, oh, well, you take this road, you take this road, we'll pair you up with, and they paired me up with. I just, I can't even remember her first name. It was a MacArthur girl and the MacArthur and the, and the Hannahs were close back then, especially Dave, because they both had the, the camps uh, up at Silver Lake and, and Clam Lake. The two of us went out. We went out for two days, uh, just drove up and checked every little back laneway. It was over a little bit to the west of Ripley, and to the north of Ripley, so north and west of Ripley. So I would say uh, the 10th, the 10th, the 12th, the 8th, which is County Road 6, just off of County Road 6 to some of the side roads there. Go up and check the roads, check for tracks, check for, you know, anything, anything that you might find suspicious. Had no signs or anything, that, uh, any clues to go on, but we used, I think we used my pickup truck and, and, uh, he really didn't come up with any. So I would have to think it was probably the Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I remember I was in the house. I walked right into the house and I, and I think somebody pointed out something like, you see, there's some blood here on the side of the steps. But I, like I said, I, I don't remember much more than that. I, I know, I don't think they, they attributed anything that they could see out of out of place in the house, like there was any sign of struggle. I know there wasn't. They had figured she had her pajamas and a house coat on, and there was a cup of tea, a single cup of tea sitting on the table. I think it was a like a side split house where you'd walk up a little bit to to the kitchen and you'd walk down to the basement. And I think it was like that that door, the, the entrance way where there was blood. And I say on the steps, it was actually on the wall. Like just just a little tiny a, a speck or two, but then they were all saying about after the fact. Why did they let us into in the house uh, a few days after? I mean, we were in the house to get instructions, but you come back out and there's lots of people standing around on the on the on the side lawn. Yeah, it was well, it was was one of those things that should have never should have never happened if it if there was a, a crime scene in there. Uh, I interacted with uh, with the the Hannah boys, um, Dave and Lloyd and Jim, mostly, and Jack a little bit. Uh, pretty much the four boys. And Lois was, because she was uh, uh, younger and a few years between even Dave and Lois, um, really didn't have much, really very little interaction with Lois. Uh, oh, well, I don't know about validity, but though it, I just recall all of us sitting at the table here saying, well, we think we know who did it, but they can't do anything. She said that. The searches sound as if they were very well organized, and I'm amazed by this. The family being under such emotional stress and still able to pull off what they did. And yes, don't worry, we too noticed the mention of the drops of blood. 
We'll be addressing that and the comment by Lois's mom, Olive, about the police knowing who was responsible for Lois's disappearance. King Carden Municipal Police were not helping, just harming, according to Jim Hanna. They would not offer assistance, but actually threatened the brothers with charges of operating an illegal investigation for taking matters into their own hands. Local police said they were just upsetting the town with their actions. We were stymied by King Carden. The police force at that time was threatening to throw me and Dave in jail for running an investigation illegally. And it wasn't until it wasn't until CTV showed up. It was Wednesday night, and and by that time the 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 provincial police had had, had seized the the investigation because they were realizing something really bad is going on here, and all we were getting is threats. I was standing in front in in Lois's front yard, screaming at the chief of police in King Carden, and 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 just daring him to throw me in jail. He wasn't helping. He was just harming. This was 3rd of July. The temperature was so hot. And all, of course, we're farm boys. We figure she's got three days. If she doesn't have water, the maximum she's got is three days. And so we were out of our minds trying to find her. But we knew we had to find her fast. Or if we found her, it wouldn't matter. And that's what we were going through. These police, these sons of bitches from King Carden Municipal Police Force that, that, that were stymieing us. Again, you, you got a, a sleepy little town. I can see why they're sort of slower on the uptake. You never know because there's different personalities all the time. I got that part. But when we were bringing people from Winnipeg, we were flying family home from Winnipeg the next day. Like we had hundreds of people showing up immediately going, mm. this isn't good. Something's not right here. We had hundreds of people showing up, motorcycles, ATVs. We were taking, we were renting planes in the air hunting radios between the planes and that ground crew. We were organizing grid searches. Immediately they're going, okay, you guys are just upset in the town. That was the town, municipal town Mm -hmm. police response. We're like, okay, even if you thought we were the biggest bunch of clowns ever, maybe they're going to a little bit of effort here, just kind of pay attention a little bit. No, so anyway, it was, honest to God. How many days into your own personal investigation did police step in did you say and, and decide to lend hand on the wednesday night that they were we were gonna we were gonna wow. dive the goddamn harbor and and uh and, and we were had a dive team we were organizing local guys we were gonna do grids and do this of the harbor because that was only one of the biggest areas in concord right we did all the ground searches as best we could we did aerial searches as best we could i mean the crops are still low on the ground we can cover a lot of ground with with an airplane we can cover hundreds of acres in no time at all the harbor was a big thing. We're organizing, you know, let's get the harbor. We're going to do the harbor now. Finally, OPP is going, yeah, no, okay. Guys, they announced Wednesday night they were officially involved. Yeah. Thursday, I believe, the dive team showed up to uh, Ken Carden to, to, to start actually helping. Time, we had done so much. Like, we had covered thousands of acres, thousands of acres, block to block to block, grid search, because we weren't asking. Sorry, I mean, if you weren't home, we went through all your buildings. We went around all the outside. If something didn't look right, I mean, we saw just, I mean, we, we were covering ground as fast because it was a timeline. It was so hot. If she it was, was so hot. happened, if she was left unattended, just unattended and unable to move mm-hmm. in, in a little hut anywhere, we had no time for her to, to survive on her own without some care. So we, we, that first three days was, oh my God. How? It was Wednesday, the Wednesday night when when the when the Kincardin police were threatening to throw me in jail. They're going to throw Dave in jail, and I was badgering them in front because we had CC, CTV was sitting there with cameras. I said, "You go, go ahead, you son of a bitch! You put, you put throw me in jail. You've been nothing but standing in our way. You've not offered to help. You have offered to hinder. You've not done done anything except try and stop us from trying to do something. You won't do anything. Go ahead, put me in jail. These guys would love it." Story. Dave Hanna recollected hearing an interesting tip on the Wednesday that would move their search efforts from King Carden to focus on a field area in Kinloss Township just outside Holyrood. We'd already gone left to the the town of King Carden and and somebody had seen a a gal walking across a field just outside of Holyrood with a peach-colored or pinkish-colored nightgown 
And they were watching her walk across the field. I'm like, okay, that's sort of odd to start with. So we moved from Kincardine and we moved out to this area. Now we're concentrating in this area, right? So you guys were the ones that got that tip about the somebody seeing the person in the the peach yeah, robe. Or, I, do you remember when you heard that? I heard it Wednesday. I heard it Wednesday. Okay. Somebody saw a gal like walking right away. Random as hell. Jesus, we had <laughs> psychics. We had planes in the oh, air. We psychics. Fucking did, uh... psychics. You can use that exact expression. Yeah. So did Fucking police psychics. actually go and search that that field area where she where this person was spotted? We had helicopters. We had a probably a you know, hundred and twenty five person line of people. We did a great search from block to block, and the cops at each end flagged the ends. So when when you're walking down the field, you saw a flag, you walked toward the outside of the line of 125 people walked down the field, mm. and the cop picked up the flags as he was going along. So he knew the outside guy, once the 125 shuffled sideways like a typewriter, the next guy had to pick up those flags on the way back. So he was walking the same line the cop walked on the way back. That was a grid search. Like, I don't know how much more thorough we could have done. Mm -hmm. We're all carrying sticks. We would turn around, look backwards. We were digging some stuff ahead of us. And we came right through that block. That's how we covered that area. Oh, and we covered it with helicopters and, and heat sensors. Wow. And that was Hollywood. That's a Hollywood area, yes. So keep in mind, to the best of our knowledge, that police had not yet released any information to the public. Oh, because the cops didn't release it. Oh, there was no did. information released at all to the public. That's so that right. Was, and the person um, that, that saw this here mm -hmm. was Harold Elliott. And he was married to Michelle's, my girlfriend at times, aunt. No one would have known that Lois's peach nightgown and robe were missing from her home and that she was more than likely wearing them when she vanished. I went on a road trip with Dave Hanna along with Nick Oldry from Please Bring Me Home, and we drove by the location mentioned in the tip. And, and, the, and, and, this, and this, this flowing peach-colored nightgown or pink-colored outfit that she was wearing, they said, because they, they hypnotized them, they said it was right along here. I think it was, it was just right along the edge of this river. Little, she was on this right side. Right here, yeah. And she was walking that way. Yeah. And they were, she was walking away from the fence, they said, because they hypnotized and they said, well, this material was blow in the breeze and you could see the backs of her legs. So she was walking away from the road. She was walking away from the road early in the morning and they, I thought, okay, you wouldn't, but it was really bizarre that they saw this gal in some kind of pinkish color walking away from the road. They're local folks. They just lived another mile and a half up the road. On day three, the Ontario Provincial Police seized the investigation just as the Hannas were about to organize their own dive teams at the harbour. Wednesday night, the OPP announced to King Carden Police that they were officially involved in Lois's case. And Thursday, they showed up with a dive team. At what point in time did they declare her officially missing? How, how many days after she disappeared? Be the Wednesday when the OPP took it over. It literally I took the Wednesday. Wow, yeah, in Florida. Yeah. When when they heard, and we had covered so much ground by this time, we had covered like when I say thousands of acres of land, all the roadsides, the beach. We had covered so much. Now we're setting up our own dive team. CTV uh, Avis Favreau, I believe, is the name. Uh, little gal that showed up. By that time, the cops couldn't even say, "Okay, don't release it anymore," because it was already over. Like by that time. Now, today, you'd be going on your cell phone, go, here's Facebook, here's something yeah. else, and you'd have it out. By the time the OPP got involved, they announced to concurrent police, okay, we're officially involved now. Because they showed up Thursday. They had the dive team on Thursday. And that's what we were planning on doing on Wednesday night. OPP admitted they could not have done what the family accomplished in the first three days. Authorities just can't start searching properties and outbuildings without permission. And, and we were and building. going building to building. We were going yeah. building to building, yeah. and you show up and you ask people if, you, if they were home. You'd ask them if they weren't home. You went through their buildings anyway. Yeah, and, like and the just, cops, OPP at the time said, "There's no way." We heard they were listening to what we were broadcasting, and they said, "There's absolutely no way they could have done what we did." 
The Hannah boys did things according to their agenda for the sake of their sister and nothing else. They had no rules or protocol they had to follow. And as a result, they were able to cover a lot of ground, something that would have been very challenging, even for the OPP. Please, I said some very unkind thing about police. It was completely directed at the Concordan police, not the OPP. The OPP, they have, they, they've done their job. They, they've been stellar. And 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 they then they follow they follow a process that that is defensible. So that I need to be very clear about that because the, the provincial police have been absolutely uh, beyond. I mean, they're frustrated. As, they're I like to think they're as frustrated as we are. Mm-hmm. That that's that's the way I feel. Like they really have tried. So when the OPP took over, did they ask you to vacate the house? No, they started, they started doing tests and, and they, and they asked for us to leave. But at, by that time, I mean, we'd made such a wreck of the place, but they were, they, they were finding spots. They were looking for handprints and their fingerprints. And they found a little spot of, of, of something that looked like it might've been blood on, on a, a piece of drywall above a stair from the kitchen down to the, to the entrance of the house. And, uh, but no, we were still plus minus using that as a, as a base. Remember, cell phones didn't exist, right? We ended up to, you know, at the public school after the fact. We, we after the fact, we got up to the public school. By this time, Thursday, July 7th, 1988, day four of Lois's disappearance, the Hannah brothers felt that they were never going to see their sister alive again. We were in this absolute panic by, by Thursday, as far as we were concerned, Lois is already dead. Like there was, it was that it was that bad because it, we had had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and heat like you cannot imagine, and it just and it never quit. You kind of get detached, but when you talk to people, and if you, honest to God, sat for one minute and thought, "Okay, I was just at a high school, no cell phones, and we're sitting." trying to look for a family member like could you like i just think about what they did it was pretty astonishing eh? oh it's crazy like i said everybody should have brothers like the hannah boys because they they gave it a thousand percent they put yeah. everything on the line for their sister and the fact that to this day they're still doing that it it shows you their uh, character in who they are and thank God they're like that because everybody, like we've seen, some people just sit back and believe in the police. Mm-hmm. Well, these guys are like, fuck the police. You're not doing anything. We're doing it. Mm-hmm. And they did it. Mm-hmm. And they didn't give a shit if they were going to get thrown in jail. Like, it's just amazing how well organized they those searches were. Mm-hmm. You know, pairing people up with so-and-so and so-and-so and taking this road and that road, like, to have the the mental the wherewithal at that point. Yeah. Like at that point in time, you're so stressed out, you're freaking out and you're still able to like, I can't organize things on the best of days. I couldn't imagine being under that kind of stress and being able to do it. So yeah. Farm boys. Crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. They, Good old they make fun of themselves for being farm boys, but family first and thank God for them. And mm-hmm. they covered a hell of a lot of ground. Yes. So there was a very interesting tip given in the first couple of days after Lois disappeared regarding a larger vehicle with its lights on running in Lois's driveway. Yeah, they, they somebody went by, they saw headlights in there. They, they were concerned about these headlights being a cop because they were half in the bag and they knew it seemed more like a suburban or something. Like it was a bigger vehicle at the at the Lois's place. And they were concerned it was a cop, so they just wanted to get the hell out of there. But they said, yeah, they, they noticed some activity when I was about 12 or 12.30 that night. So depending on the angle you looked at it, it could have been a truck, maybe? Yeah, well, they, they assume it was a truck, yeah. Could it have been someone stopping by that she knew and she opened the door for? Is this where she was abducted? I think she would have put up enough of a fuss if she opened the door to a stranger. There would have been some signs of a struggle, but nothing was out of place. So 
Maybe she went out to the running vehicle and sat in it speaking to someone she knew. And who knows, maybe the vehicle was the actual crime scene. Maybe she was forced to drive away in it. We were fortunate enough to interview one of the lead investigators from the Ontario Provincial Police first on the case, Detective Constable Bill McCaig. McCaig lived in King Carden at the time and got involved in Lois's case within the first week or two of her disappearance. The initial investigation went on for approximately two to three years, according to McCaig, and was opened up again in 1996 with two more new investigators, which gave them fresh minds. He stated that the OPP were brought in as their resources were much more substantial compared to that of a small force. Resources consisted of an identification unit, helicopters, canines, and of course, much more manpower. When asked what the standard operating procedure was in the case of a missing person, he's quoted as responding, at first, and usually when an adult goes missing, a police force will take down the information but not commence a full investigation as if it were a child. The family stepped in and used the house as a search headquarters. There were hundreds of people in the house and on the grounds until OPP took over. I must say the family did a good job of conducting searches in King Carden. He went on to say that the town was quite concerned. Many people assisted in searching and offering tips, most of which were valid, but as such with any case, there were wild goose chases. Of course, we, we hear that so often. As for the people questioned in regards to Lois's disappearance, McCaig estimated that there were hundreds, if not more. Approximately 20 people were polygraphed. These were mainly conducted to eliminate those who did not have a concrete alibi. He was involved himself in many searches saying, quote, numerous times people will report hawks, etc., flying circles in a field. They would be searched. People found bones in an earthen basement. It was dug up. Gravel pits were searched for recent dig marks. Depressions in the ground and bush lots were dug up. It was endless. Although he retired in 2004, he still believes that the case is solvable. We just need someone to say something. I had the pleasure of speaking with retired Detective Constable Bill McKegg on the phone and recall him describing a search on a large farm in the Hollyrood area, southeast of King Carden, approximately 16 miles from Lois's house. This is the same search you heard Dave Hanna describe in detail earlier in this episode. The search took place in the days following the sighting of the woman in the peach-colored nighty and robe. It was an aerial search involving a heat-seeking camera provided by the Ministry of Natural Resources. The search covered approximately 500 acres. There were 8 to 10 hot spots reported. The OPP checked them all out, and all were dead cattle beasts, mostly in bush or swamp areas. When Constable Detective Bill McKegg retired in 2004, he told reporters he would like to solve the case before he walked out of his office for the last time. How can you disappear off the face of the earth, he asked, then continued. We have a person of interest in mind, but we need more evidence before making an arrest. So, 15 years after Lois disappeared, police are publicly stating that they have a suspect in mind. There were also more than a few tips that came in practically back-to-back -back involving hydro towers and the assumption that the holes would be a perfect place to dispose of a body. Apparently, there was a hydro line being installed in the area that summer. A gentleman who had been working on the project was interviewed by Please Bring Me Home. He confirmed that two large holes were in fact open over the course of that July long weekend. He said he knew it was that specific weekend as he had been interviewed by police around that time. He stated it was common practice to leave the holes open on a Friday and come back and fill them on the Monday. The man confirmed that he saw no disturbances in the deep holes as he recalls seeing the imprint of the drill bit in the dirt at the bottom of the holes on Monday. 
Of course, things like this just didn't happen in a small community, and people were very nervous and cautious after hearing that one of their local women had gone missing. Six months after her disappearance, police released sketches of two men seen at 9.30 a.m. July the 4th near McGee's. So you'll recall July 4th was the Monday that Lois was reported missing. McGee's was the clothing store that she worked at. A mother and daughter had spotted the men and the sketches were based on information they gave while under hypnosis. Police appealed to the public for any information regarding the identities of the two men. They were not considered suspects at all, but police did want to speak with them. Many tips came in, but unfortunately, that went nowhere. The men were never identified. And we will have copies of these sketches up on our Facebook page. The torture of not knowing where Lois is, is a constant for the family. But then every time human remains are found, they feel panic and are tortured in a different way. They may finally have to face what actually happened to Lois, and that could be unbearable. But the not knowing is worse, they say. An article published in the Owen Sound Sun Times, written by Lise Thorbjörnson, Reads, a registered nurse from London found four teeth joined by bone matter while swimming at Station Beach, which is located in King Carton. But she threw the teeth back and did not report her discovery to the police for four days. Rumors started circulating that the teeth might belong to Hannah. As suspicion mounted, Hannah's family was notified and police divers launched a search. Even a sand extraction pump was brought in to sift through sand, but the search was unsuccessful. Then in May 1990, it looked like the mystery was finally solved when the badly decomposed body of a woman was found in the St. Clair River near Sarnia. The body was clad in a nightgown and slippers, articles similar to those Hannah was believed to be wearing the night she disappeared. Two recreational scuba divers found the body wrapped in a plastic bag and bound at the waist and knees. It had been weighted with a cement block. Once again, the media blitz kicked in, And once again, it wasn't Hannah. Forensic tests determined the body belonged to a middle-aged woman. No sooner had the roller coaster lurched forward than it screeched to another grinding halt. Around the same time as the Sarnia incident, a woman's body was found northeast of Guelph. It turned out to be the body of 31-year-old Vivian Bremner. I can't even imagine what it must have been like. Like each time these discoveries were made, the media hype was incredible. It was such a roller coaster ride for Lois's family and everybody that was following her case closely. It just must be so frightening to to hear about human remains and you know where your mind's going to go automatically. Well, Susie, you and I remember Lois's disappearance very vividly. I mean, yeah, we do. Susie yeah. and I, for those of you that don't know, are sisters, and we grew up half an hour from King Carden, where Lois was living. And she was only three years older than myself, five years older than Susie. I can remember hearing about it all over the news. And it was crazy. It was scary. It was so scary. Did it change your perspective at the time of watching? Oh, where gosh. You were oh, yeah. You totally paid so much attention to who you were with, where you were, who knew where you were, where you were going. Yeah, I think we were at the age that, you know, you were more cognizant of your surroundings, especially something like that that happened so close to home. And it was so mysterious. Like, it was just crazy. Well, and back then, you know, because we didn't have social media back then, if and especially in the summertime, it, we grew up in a tourist town, so you'd go out with all your friends and there would always be people out in the bars that you didn't know, strangers. And, you know, you'd look at everybody like creepy what do you guy, know? creepy guy. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. I remember thinking how how pretty she was and that she had her whole life ahead of her. Yeah. You know, but yep. then when you're that age, also, you think this won't happen to you. Because I remember going out and, you know, never putting my head in that space. 
that something could happen. You thought you were invincible. Yeah, I well, yeah. I did. Well, and I think, you know, everybody will hear in our next season, Lois Hanna and Lisa Mays disappeared within weeks of one another. And Lois was half an hour south of us and Lisa was half an hour northeast of us. So it was really scary thinking that mm-hmm. there was a serial killer on the loose in our midst targeting women our age. Mm-hmm. And it was real. It was real. So yeah, you can think that you're invincible, but when it hits so close to home. Absolutely. And it's, you know, we've listened to Lois's brothers talk about her. Well, I think we've grown to know Lois through just meeting and speaking with her brothers and her former boss, Debbie. Candy and I had a wonderful conversation with her and you could hear it in her voice how much, you know, it still affects her to this day. And you guys can relate because she was an up and coming, like she was in the fashion, she was business, she had her head on her shoulders and you two had your own business and you guys were just go-getters, almost like Lois. Yeah, I have no doubt that if we'd met her back then, we'd have been instant friends for sure. Mm -hmm. If she were still with us today, that we'd love her and we'd get along famously. Yeah, I can picture that for sure. (laughs) Got along. I don't know if anybody didn't get along with her. I was just going to say that very thing. I don't think there's anybody I can think of that didn't like Lois. Yeah. Lois, where are you? So girls, remember how we said we wanted to circle back? I just wanted to make sure we don't forget about those two drops of blood that one of the searchers had commented on that was found inside Lois's home. So there was a very interesting article regarding this that was written in the Own Sound Sun-Times. It reads, quote, "For, For years, all that was known about the blood was that it came from a male. In 1998, DNA technology provided OPP with a list of 14 persons of interest, all men, Police worked to eliminate names from that list and said in early 1999, they had been watching one of those men for nine months. OPP Detective Inspector Walter Baker said at that time, police are cautiously optimistic there will be some resolution. That resolution is still awaited. Detective Constable Andre Bayard says all but one person has been excluded from consideration. One name remains on the list. Bayard will not identify that person, nor will he discuss what police are trying to do to either exclude him or implicate him. So apparently, OPP suspected this person within the first week of Lois's disappearance. This person was known to Lois and her family and was also someone the Hannah family had a hard time suspecting of such a heinous deed. They actually defended him, at least in the beginning. We will discuss this person of interest as well as many others in our next episode. Had this occurred in this time, in this day and age, we wouldn't have this conversation because we would have already known because back in 1988, that technology did not exist. It took us 10 years to put the prime suspect at the event. You know, all, all of the photographs and Facebook and all the social media today, like it's, it's oh amazing God. anybody gets away with anything. But mm-hmm. back in those days, that didn't exist. The, the DNA evidence and, and, and the like was just infantile in 1988. So that's, that was our family's misfortune. Before we sign off, a reminder to you all who Please Bring Me Home is. For those of you who are already familiar with Lois's case, you may already know this. They are a not-for-profit organization comprised of volunteers with varied backgrounds. Some retired law enforcement, some canine handlers, some with forensics experience. Their mission is to solicit anonymous tips regarding cold case missing persons across Canada. Please Bring Me Home have been committed to researching Lois's case for over five years. And in 2019, they received three closely related tips that brought light to a previously unsearched area between Holyrood and King Carden. The tipster was awakened between 2 and 3 a.m. on July the 4th to the sound of a woman screaming. From where the scream was heard, a drainage ditch 
can be followed to a location where a white bra was found a year later, perhaps completely unrelated. Further down the line is where two people witnessed a woman in a pink peach nightgown coming out of the bush on the night Lois disappeared. Please Bring Me Home conducted a large-scale search covering a 4 by 2 kilometer area. They are heavily invested in this case, and we are so pleased to be working collaboratively with them to shed even more light on Lois's story. We speak with Matt and Nick on a regular basis, fact-checking, sharing tips and theories, and we'll be sharing interviews with them in our next episode as well. So reach out to us or please bring me home and you can do so absolutely anonymously if that's your preference. We can be reached at 437-374-3030. You can call or text that number. Our email is sheddinglightpodcast at gmail.com. Please bring me home can be reached at their website, pleasebringmehome.com or you can reach them at their anonymous tip hotline. 1-226-702-2728. We really hope and pray that we hear from you. Somebody know something. If you have any information about the disappearance of Lois Hanna, no matter how trivial and insignificant it may seem, please reach out. The Ontario Provincial Police Criminal Investigations Branch can be reached at 705-329-6111 or toll-free at 1-888-310-1122. Alternately, you can call Crime Stoppers 1-800-222-TIPS, 1-800-222-8477. The Kincardine branch of the Ontario Provincial Police can be reached at 519-396-3341. Who could have taken Lois? Love interest? A complete stranger? An authority figure even? Many people claim that Paul Bernardo was in the area that weekend. He had family with a cottage nearby and was known to frequent the area. It, it is interesting. The uh, it is interesting. The rumor that um, you know the allegation that a purse stolen from the Lucknow no dance was later found at Paul Bonato's uh, residence. Join us for episode four as we discuss the suspects in Lois's disappearance. And as always, this podcast is dedicated to the memory of Nolan Panchishan. We love you, Nolan. Love you, Nolan. Love you. If you like what we do and support our endeavors, please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple iTunes or on Spotify. Because the more listeners we have, the more apt we are to find answers for these families. If you don't like listening to us, just don't do it. No need to be nasty about it. We do what we do out of respect for the families of the missing to get people talking again, to shed light on the case in the hopes the answers are ready to surface all these years later. And we can't do that without you, your help and support. You are an integral part of what we do, and we are oh so grateful for you, our dedicated listeners. Please, go out there and spread the word. Help us shed light. The phone